Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Scrollfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, hop on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you, as always, very much for your continued interest and support. Featured in this episode is co-founder, multi-instrumentalist, lead singer, songwriter, and producer, Felton Pilot of Confunction, who, along with Michael Cooper, led one of the most successful, distinctive, and, frankly, awesome funk R&B bands of all time. First roaring onto the scene with the number one R&B smash, Fun, that's with two Fs, in 1977. By the time the seven-member Northern California group called it quits nearly 10 years later, they had released 11 albums, at least half of which earned them gold sales status. And they also had 16 additional top 40 R&B hit singles. Those hits, however, only scratched the surface of the dozens of killer confunction songs. A sampling of those includes Chase Me, Too Tight, Got to Be Enough, Shake and Dance with Me, Let Me Put Love on Your Mind, Make It Last, Baby I'm Hooked, and Love's Train. The last few of those are ballads and underscore the fact that confunction was just as masterful at slow grooves as they were at low down funk. And even they were also adept at catchy pop for that matter, despite never crossing over on the scale of, say, an Earth, Wind, and Fire. Confunction's amazing catalog of music has stood the test of time and sounds just as fantastic today as when I bought most of those records on the days that they each came out. In terms of record uh, sales and awards, Pilot went on to even greater success by lending his production and writing skills to MC Hammer's first three albums, 1988's Triple Platinum, Let's Get It Started, 1990's 17 Times Platinum, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him, which included the Grammy-winning smash, You Can't Touch This, as one of the biggest-selling albums of all time. And lastly, 1991's Five Times Platinum, Too Legit to Quit. Pilot then released his solo debut, Nothing But Love, spoken here in 2006, and in 2015 contributed to Confunction's first studio album in nearly 30 years called More Than Love. In 1993, he reunited with Michael Cooper and other band members to bring Confunction back to the stage, and the group has been performing consistently ever since, including shows <coughs> this year and later in the year. Here, in this Truth and Rhythm, in great detail, Pilot shares the group's beginnings, their rise to star, uh, stardom, insights into the albums and songs, the friction that led to its demise, other successes and challenges, and coming full circle to performing as can function today. I had a great time with Felton, and I'm sure you will too. Thanks again for joining us. I'm so happy to welcome to Truth and Rhythm, a driving force behind one of funk and R&B's all-time powerhouse groups. In the person of singer, multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, Mr. Felton Pilot. Felton, so glad to have you here today. How are you? Hi, well, man. I'm doing wonderful. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad we could finally uh, hook this up. And... Um, you're back from, uh, you guys just did a show this past weekend, right? Yes, we played at the uh, Tangiers Club in Akron, Ohio. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite places to play. It's an intimate, intimate atmosphere. And, uh, you know, on, I get to, on one of our songs, I get to walk through the audience, you know. Uh, I, I, I enjoy doing that, you know. Yeah, I've never been there. About how big is it? Uh, it seats probably about 300. Uh huh. Yeah, and we did uh, two shows. Two shows and uh, I love playing there, you know. That's great. I mean, it's so great that you guys are still out there doing it, you know, and, and touring and performing fairly regularly. So that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've been, um, 
Michael and I put it back together in 93 and it has not stopped. It's been, it's been a <laughs> continuously rolling since then, you know, I think, but uh, last year we did like 52 concerts, which is, which is a lot for a group of our genre. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, it speaks to just the enduring, you know, quality of the music and the performances. And I mean, it's just, it's timeless. Well, thank you, man. Thank you, man. It's, it's, plus it's a lot of fun, which is, which at my age, which is still very important to me. <laughs> the fact that it has got to be fun. Yeah, but yeah, no when doubt. When it starts feeling like work, then I'll quit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a big fan. I told you that already from way back, ever since the Secrets album. So this is a great thrill to talk to you and have you on the show. All right, man. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure. And I think uh, you're coming to us from Las Vegas, correct? Yes, right. I've been here for about a year. I'm a music director for a show that's going on now called Motown Extreme. And I'm music director for an upcoming show. It's a one woman show with all the original material. The artist, her name is Christy Love. She and I wrote all, all the songs, I think 14 songs. And there's a, the, 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 the play is written and she's talking to her investors or whatever that's, and they're hoping to start that sometime in July. So um, this is my new work, my new workplace when I'm not doing good function. Nice, something new and fresh, right? Yeah, yeah, and fun, <laughs> and Excellent. fun. Well, um, moving way back from the current, I want okay. to uh, you know get a foundation of, of you know what Felton was like um, growing up. You know when you first got into music, and you know did you come from a musical household, and and where are you from originally? Okay, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, um, my parents moved to uh, Cal. My father was in the Navy. He was a medical officer in the Navy. And so we, I know we moved around a lot, right? And in, and in this particular case, I think he got stationed at, uh, at Mare Island in Vallejo. And he left me, uh, he took my two younger sisters and he left me behind, uh, I'm so sorry, let me decline that, my apologies. He left me to live uh, with my grandmother in Jackson, right? Um, so I lived with my grandmother for probably about a year um, my grandmother had a piano in her house, and so I was constantly, you know, fooling around with that. There's been a piano, and then once I got to Vallejo, um, there was a piano in my mother's house. So there's, there's, there's always been a piano in the house. Um, my mother was a music major. Um, my father just loved to sing, you know, he, he wasn't musically inclined or anything, but he loved jazz. Um, and I do remember back in the days when they, when we had a hi-fi, the, 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 there's an old, old word for you. It was a, it was a fight between the two of them who got to the hi-fi first, right? And if my mom got to it, we'd be listening to Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, you know, all the classical stuff. If my dad got to it first, we'd be listening to Duke Ellington, uh, <laughs> you know, Count Basie, you know, the Frank Sinatra orchestras. You know, it was like, I grew up on multiple, multiple genres. Um, by the time I was taking, officially took piano lessons, I was already knew what court, yeah, knew, had a basic understanding of how chords worked. You know, I, I, I knew how to play a C major seventh chord, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but my first, I st first started off on, on drums. That was in fourth grade. I, I tried out for the school band. Um, they had too many drummers, so they forced me over to trumpet. And so I took trumpet lessons in school for a couple of years. Um, piano lessons, taught myself how to play guitar and bass. Um, so then when it came time, oh, and I started my own band when I was 16 years old. Um, but I, mean, I need, I need to tell you this story though. <clears throat> Before I started my own band, um, and I had just learned, I was just, you know, beginning stages of learning guitar. I remember the first thing I learned was Tighten Up by Archie Bell and the Gels. Right? You know, you know, two chords, right? And uh, there was a guy that lived around the corner from me. His name was Donald Osborne, right? His older brother, Fulton Osborne, was like 
the local musical genius in town. You know, every weekend, you know, he was you know known to be playing somewhere, right? At somebody's fashion show or whatever. And Donald was being the younger brother, was probably tired of living in his older brother's shadow. So he's gonna start a band, right? And since I live right around the corner, he invited me to come join his band, you know, playing guitar. Um, I'm about 15, you know, something like that. Um, his drummer, we had a drummer named David Graham, cousin to Larry Graham. Mm -hmm. And a bass player, a uh, white guy named Walter Kors, right? And so, you know, we're, 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 we're moving along and Donald says, now, now, so we're now going to learn the song Alfie, just, just to play, right? And I got all excited because at that point, my voice had not officially changed over yet. And I could sing Alfie in Dionne Warwick's key. Not a problem, right? Got this, right? And so I asked him, hey, can, can, why don't you let me sing lead on this one? Now, I, I wasn't aware of the protocol of that if it's his band, you know, he's, he's the one who's supposed to be doing lead, whatever. But he's like, sure, come on over, you know. And so, you know, Saturday morning, I walk over to his house and um, and he plays piano and I sing my heart out. And he said to me, Felton, if I were you, I would stick to playing guitar because you will never, ever make it as a singer. <laughs> um, I quit. I, I, I refused to accept that. And I and I quit and started my own band. I have to give thanks to him for saying that to me because <laughs> had he not did that, I wouldn't have made that move to start my own band. Had I not started my own band, then I wouldn't not have gotten noticed by Michael Cooper who had his own band called Project Soul. And in 1970, when my band broke up, he, he dashed over, to my, dude, uh, you available? Uh, why don't you come play with us? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Uh, let me think about it. Yeah. Okay. So he invited me to play in Project Soul in 1970, um, and uh, I mean that was that was that was a whole nother whole nother timeline there. You know. Well, for, uh, for those who don't know, the Vallejo is like uh, in Northern California. What is it kind of situated near? It's about 35 miles northeast of San Francisco. Uh, 50 miles south of Napa. If you were going to the wine country, you pretty much have to drive, you know, from San Francisco, you pretty much have to drive through Vallejo to get there. So did you guys go to the same school? Or um, no, everyone, <clears throat> the bass player, Cedric, um, he's from Fairfield, so he went to a different school. Uh, I went to, I lived on the east side of town, so I went to, to, uh, to Hogan. And for two years, my parents sent me to a private school, so I was the only guy who didn't go with the school with everybody, with everybody else, you know. Uh, but we did. Everyone, every, all seven members of the band wound up going to the same junior college together, and we're all taking um, music theory lessons from this wonderful gentleman named his name was David Froelich, who was Sly Stone's <laughs> young music teacher. He's he's passed away now, but. Um, we studied under him, uh, learned learned so much from him as far as music theory and stuff goes. But yeah, we were all all in the same music theory class. Wow. So you uh, first connected with with Michael Cooper, and what were your first impressions of him? I had got my first impressions with him when when my band was playing a competing band with his band, and that was my first time seeing them in a battle of the band situation. And up to that day, I was thinking my band was pretty good. When I saw these guys on stage, I'm like, man, <laughs> we need some work. And I I took my guys back and we, we had to go back and do some woodshedding, added some choreography and added some um, some uniforms and stuff. You know, uh, So seeing Project Soul back then was that was a big inspiration point. So, uh, you know, I was so glad he asked me to join. I was like, man, this that's kind of situation. I'm, I want to be it. And what was your uh, primary role in that first, uh, you know, version of the group? Ah, okay. Uh, well, they already had a keyboard player, already had a guitar player, already had a trumpet player, which was the instruments that I played in my band. 
So at that point, I went out and I bought a trombone and taught myself to train trombone just 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 to fill out just to fill out the horn section. Um, they let me come in and start doing arrangements on 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 songs and stuff. And I remember the first one that they let me do the vocal arrangements was we were doing the top forty band. We were doing Have You Seen It by the Shylights. Mm -hmm. So they let me you know do the vocal arrangements on that. That was you know that was exciting. Um, uh, we went to the studio. Um, they allowed me to write the song that was supposed to be on the B side. Um, and I just kind of half slid into, you know, partial music director, you know, where, or, or I, I just, they would say the song was going on and I would just take the time to just go ahead and learn all the parts. So that when it came time, you know, I would say, hey, yeah, you, you need to be playing this and blah, 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 you know. Um, but that, 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 that was amazing because, I mean, you know, we weren't doing a lot of original material back then. So now it was about listening to the radio and figure out what songs that, that we're going to play. And I, I learned early on the, 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 the top compliment that you can get as a top 40 band is, Damn, y'all sound just like the record, right? <laughs> right. So I was always my goal to learn the parts, the way they were played on the record, and I spent a lot, a lot of time doing that. And um, that that worked out very well for us when we came time to play for Rufus Thomas. Um, we had to, uh, and we met him kind of by accident. We had just learned that Rufus had a big song called Breakdown. I think it was at 1971-ish. I'm not, I'm not sure, Rufus Thomas. Um, and, we had, and, and we had learned the song, right? And then there was a, a, a benefit going on at the Hardy Theater in Oakland, California. And um, Rufus was there, Stevie Wonder was there, Donny Hathaway played, and we had been called and said, hey, y'all, you guys need to get over there because you guys are, we were told that we could play. So we're, we're, we're standing there and the dressing room is downstairs from the, uh, from the stage. And Rufus was playing with another band up on the stage. And in the middle of their performance, he boldly said, the, and uh, Rufus had just hired these guys, not hired. He asked this other band, did they know the song? And they said, yes. So he just said, fine, let's just go play it. Right. And it was walking the dog. Right. And they didn't have the feel that he wanted. So he told the audience, y'all hold on, just, just give me a minute. And he told the band, you guys just wait right here. And he stuck his head in the dressing room. Is there a band down here that can play? <laughs> yeah, he said, you guys know Breakdown? Yeah, yeah, we just learned it. Come on up. So he walks up on stage, fires the other band on stage. Y'all can go. And the audience waits while we walk in and we plug in and, um, Man, you know, so this is our chance, chance to play. And I remember him, distinctly remember him walking over to me, looking at me in my eyes, says, you sure you know this? Yes, sir. <laughs> One, two, three. And we sounded just like his record. <laughs> uh, had it down. He was happy. So then the following year, 1972, when it came time for us to do Watch Stacks, he hunted us down and had to make sure that we were his backup band for the Watch Stacks movie. Wow, that's like a James Brown or Chuck Berry kind of story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what was that experience like when you did that show in front of all those people? Hundred one hundred and four thousand people. Three weeks prior to that, we were still a top forty band up in Vallejo, California. All right, man, that was it, it. Was scary. It was scary. We were too scared to make a mistake. Um. Because uh, for those who don't know about the Watts Stacks thing, you know, every year the Watts community in Los Angeles would put on a, a, a concert, right? And this particular year, Stacks Records got together and said, well, look, if you let us provide all the music, we'll do, you know, we'll, we, we will provide all the music if you allow us to film it and make a documentary out of it and record a live album. So on that day, uh, Three weeks after we left town, we've now become part of a movie that's being filmed live, part of a record that's being 
<laughs> recorded live. Man, it was intimidating, and but also you like, you're like 17 or 18 at that point. Or yeah, how yeah. Uh, hold on, 1920, uh, 72. I was uh, 20. Yeah, I 19. So yeah, I hadn't had my I hadn't had my 20th birthday yet. Hmm. And, and so, man, that and being on the stage with Isaac Hayes was performing that night, and uh, it was another one of those magic moments because I remember standing on the side of the stage and watching the Bar Hayes perform, and they were doing Son of Shaft, and they had charisma, and spark, and energy, and outfits, and I had that same feeling watching the Bar Hayes as when I did watching Project Soul back when in, the, uh, in that competition thing. I said, man, that's where, we, that's where we need to be. And we went back and re, revamped ourselves <laughs> later. And uh, yeah, we learned from some great people, man, we really did. So at, at, at Watt Stacks, how many uh, you know, members of what would be the Confunction lineup were involved? Uh, all seven of us. All you seven? Know. Also, we uh, there was the uh, the only thing what we what we had to leave behind to go with the Soul Children is we were the Project Soul Review. We were the actually the, the largest, the highest paid local band in the Bay Area. But it was not only the seven band members; actually, it was eight because we had a we had a percussionist. Um. So we had you know drummer, keys, guitar, bass, three horns, and a and a conga player. Um. But for the review, we also had a featured female vocalist, a featured male vocalist. Um, his name was uh, Eddie, Eddie Bailey. Her name was Jean London. Uh, there was a singing group. Um, Charlene and the Punkinettes. And it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and an and a, and a, and a MC comedian. And we would get out there and do a whole three hour show with that. I mean, there was the Project Soul Review. But in order to be the backup for the Soul Children, we had to leave everything that had to do with the review behind. And the Soul Children had their own percussion player, so we had to leave him behind. So it was the 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 rhythm section and the three horns that was the that now became the nucleus of Project Soul. When did you guys first get outside of California to play? August 4th, 1972. That's the day that the Soul Children picked us up from Vallejo and drove us to Memphis to be their backup band. Um, the Soul Children, uh, we had played, they were coming out to do a concert in 1971. No, hold on. I joined in 70. They came out in 1969 to do a concert um, or, uh, actually, it might have been early 70s to do a concert in Oakland, and they hired Project Soul to be the backup band. I hadn't joined the band yet, but Michael asked me to come play with them to provide a third horn and, and additional keyboards, right? And so we, uh, Project Soul was their backup band. They came out to do a concert uh, in Oakland at the Showcase Theater uh, late July, and Michael and I snuck in to go see the show. And since the club was packed, he and I just sat down on the floor <laughs> where they were performing. And we talked to Norman after the concert. Norman West was the leader of the Soul Children. We talked to him after the show. And Norman's like, uh, 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 what are you guys doing now? One of us, I can't remember which one of us said, oh, we we're just hanging around waiting to be your backup band. And he's like, really? And he fired his band sent them home and said, y'all serious? Let's go. So we left Vallejo August 4th. They had a big old Greyhound bus that they were using for their you know, transportation, picked us up in Vallejo, and that was the start of our next journey. You know, Because at that point, we're now playing a different city every weekend. You know, if, if I'm not mistaken, our, our first performance was in St. Louis. You know, uh, and we were the backup band steadily. That's all we did for, for two years. Really. Wow. You were costing a lot of folks their jobs back then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Too darn good. And also, and also bold enough to, to suggest things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. We were joking, but you know, we were like, oh, oh man. Wait a minute. And it was horrible to run into those guys later in Memphis. <laughs> that was like, uh, no, I wasn't me. It was somebody else, you know. Yeah. Wow. So uh, take me, Felton, from, you know, that point to the forming of confunction. Hmm. The Soul Children had a couple of hit records, but after two years, around that show, their gigs started slowing down and we were getting paid on a nightly basis. So it was getting kind of hard to sustain ourselves. Now they were paying us $65 a night per musician, which back in 1972, that, that, that actually was, was, was pretty good money, right? And what we would do is that we would operate as a commune. We would just take everyone's money and add it together. We, I think at that point we were paying rent on a three bedroom house or four bedroom or whatever. And at some point we even got a couple of you know apartments and we would join everyone's money, pay for the apartment, pay for food for everybody. And I think we paid ourselves an allowance of like 25, dollars a week um but their gigs were getting smaller and smaller and we're like saying oh, well shoot we could, yeah we could, do, we could do better on our own you know, recalling that we were the highest paid local band in 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 vallejo in, in in the san francisco Bay area well if we did it back there we can certainly do it here in memphis tennessee so we quit the soul children and decided to pursue that route so we I distinctly remember talking to a guy uh, who owned a club called um, Club Rosewood, Memphis, right? And, you know, uh, hey, we're from California, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, why don't you hire us to, to, to play at your club? And he's like, how much you guys uh, charge? But yeah, well, back in California, we were making $1,500 a night. I mean, which is, you know, which was a fact, you know? He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure you did in California, but you know, I've never heard of you. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you whatever you can bring in. I think we made about $30 that, <laughs> you know, you put our name up on the billboard and we, you know, we had our egos handed back to us. Um, but we set up a thing called college night where every Thursday night colleges, you know, anyone with a college ID could get in for $2. Right. And so that was an ongoing thing. We were asked to do some, music for a TV show to, to perform a, a TV show. We thought we were playing live. Said, oh, no, 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 you, 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 uh, you do it to a track. So we went into a recording studio to record the track. And the guy at the studio, his name was Ted Sturgis. We recorded Audio Dimension. Oh, you guys sound great. And he kept inviting us to come back, you know. And so we kept back and we, you know, we kept, kept recording. And he finally says, okay, uh, it's time for you guys to pay your bill. <laughs> bill? <laughs> what, what bill? Flip oh, the script on oh, you. <laughs> studio time is not free. Oh, no. You've been charged every, every time you come in here per hour. So here's your bill for $10,000. No! <laughs> you know, well... On the other hand, you could sign this recording contract and you don't have to worry about the $10,000. Okay, we'll sign the contract. So Ted Sturgis, owner of Audio Dimension Studios, became our producer. It was through Ted Sturgis who got us signed, caught the attention of Freetone Records, which was owned by Estelle Axton. Several years ago, Estelle Axton and her brother Jim Stewart started Stax Records. First two letters of Stewart, first two letters of Axton, Stax. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah, we want to sign you guys to a contract. We're a little concerned about your name, Project Soul. We feel that name is kind of limiting. So, you guys need to change your name. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, so we, went through this huge procedure of trying to figure out what else to call ourselves. And then we remembered that we used to play a song that we had picked up 
that was played by the, the Nightlighters, who was the backup band for New Birth, right? And they had a song called Confunction. So we just adapted that song's title as our name. Um, and we put out a single, Mr. Tambourine Man, a, 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 a R&B funk version of the Bob Dylan classic. Mm. I heard he was not a big fan because <laughs> it didn't sound anything. It sounded nothing like the original tambourine man. I mean, if this was cool, imagine cool in the game playing Bob Dylan. Okay, and that's that's where we borrowed the groove from. We we borrowed the groove from Jungle Boogie by by, by Cool in the Game. Um, and I've always wondered. So they had an issue with the word soul, but they were okay with funk. Go figure. Okay, so um, it was. We got the attention of Mercury Records, uh, Ted Sturgis, you know, I'll thank him for that, arranged to have um, Charlie Fash from Mercury Records come down to see us at Club Rosewood, and he was impressed, so he signed us to a contract for Mercury Records. Um, now, at that point, <clears throat> how, how many original songs, you were starting to do some original songs at that point, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. We had gotten to the point where I we had at least one or at least one original song per set that we could do. And for instance, every night at college night, we would be sure to play play the original songs. We had one song called Akasaka, which became so popular they would ask us to play it. You know, everyone loved dancing to, to the song, and it was just a, a group that we originally made up on stage and then just developed it as they went on. Um, we had, the, we had two, two, the, the two records that we did on Freetone Records, uh, uh, Mr. Tambourine Man and a, and a single called Now and Forever. Um, uh, on the flip side of that was a song called The Click. Um, so yeah, we were starting to, to, to develop our our, our writing chops, and and, and you know like like every other musician who is every every musician is a conglomeration of all the musicians that he's that he's listened to over his life, right? So our sound was based on bits and pieces of songs that, that we played on stage. So in, worked into the confunction originals were little bits and pieces of the Ohio players and the Commodores. Um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, oh, of course, yeah. You know, so that was um, a tower, tower of power. It, you know, so that yeah, you know, we were a conglomeration of all the people that we idolized, all all the people who, whose records that we played on stage. So, um, and the very cool part about that was then. With Earth, Wind, and Fire being our, our our ultimate heroes, you know, that to get Skip Scarborough, who wrote "Can I Love" and um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the song. Would you mind if I touched, if I kiss, if I uh, "Lover's Holiday" for for Earth, Wind, and Fire? He had written um, um, uh, "Don't Ask My Neighbor" for uh. The emotions and, and and so for us to snag him as a producer it was like, oh man, and he, and he worked with her for the five man, wonderful, yeah. Um, so, and so combined all that with everything else that we've been learning is that that was that was that was the sound and and even and even within Confunction we had Michael was was like the uh, Maurice White and um, my voice was the Philip Bailey so you know it, it worked out fine. Yeah. So that first record came out in uh, was it seventy five, the with Mercury. Yes, uh, 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 free tone, free tone. Uh, you, you, we're talking about the, the, the Mister Tambourine Man thing. Uh, well, I have here um, one that came out called the Memphis Sessions, and then oh. one called Organized uh, Confunction. Now, and, and then there's one uh, just called Confunction that was on Mercury. Now here's the here's the real deal. The one called Organized Confunction and the Memphis Sessions. Remember, I was told you that that guy kept telling us to come back and record in the studio. 
All those, those, all those were the outtakes that we did from when we recorded in the studio. Not to mention that people would occasionally hire our horn section to do horns for them, right? And so also included on at least one of those records, if someone else, I don't even remember who they were, and the only thing that's can function on that record is the horn section playing backgrounds for whoever that was singing. So both of, the, both of those records, Organized Can Function and the Memphis Sessions, are all outtakes from when we were just walking and recording just for the fun of it. In our mind, that was never supposed to be, re to be released. But it wasn't part of the contract once we got signed to, to Mercury. But the first Mercury record uh, had sure feels good to me on it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great, great track. And we were able to snag. Um, I can't. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I can't remember his name. The guy. He, he had produced Tower Power, which is which is why I, I gave him the Ron Capone. That's it, Ron Capone. He engineered and and produced uh, Tower Power's early stuff. Um, so we snagged him, and that it worked out good. The record sold about sixty thousand copies. Um. And the guy Ted Sturgis had written himself into our contract because he was going to get an override on our first record. And once the record sold enough copies to pay for itself, the record company said, okay, fine, we're done with that. Now let's go do some serious recording. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so they, and so yeah, once the record paid for itself, they stopped promoting it. Um, but uh, sure. oh man, it sure feels good to me. Hold on. That started from a groove we used to play on stage as a top 40 band. We got into the habit of recording ourselves every night, right? At the end of some songs, we just break off some other groove. That started off as a groove of Michael. We used to play at the end of somebody else's record, probably Cool and Gang, another Cool and Gang song. And we would just jam that. So Michael took that groove, turned it into a song. I added lyrics to it. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the Michael Cooper film pilot collaboration thing, you know, where he'd come up with a great track um, or I'd come up with a track and then he'd either write lyrics to my track or, or, or vice versa. Well, the next record, 76 uh, Secrets, is where I got on board the Confunction uh, train and where uh, so many people did because Fun was a number one R&B hit and really just launched you guys. Um, but there are all other great tracks too. I loved Confunctionizia. Was this one of the funkiest jams you guys ever did? Um, I'll set you out okay. Another great track, and and so I see that Scarborough was was really. I mean, not only involved in the production, but also the songwriting, right? So yes. Yeah. Would you consider him a kind of a mentor at that point. Ab absolutely. Learned so much from from his procedure in the studio and his perfect um, his sense of perfection and um and, and and feel you know uh for instance on the song secrets that was a two-day song it was never it was not something that written we had written before going into the studio we were just taking a break a skip had walked out in the studio and he was just hearing a chord progression in his head and that was and it was the chord progression for secrets and you know, I'm I'm eating my hamburger. And I'm like, dude, I like that. So we go in and eat, and we just lay down a track right then, right there, based on that chord progression they're doing. I took a copy home, wrote lyrics for it, came back the next day, recorded the vocals. After that, Skip worked out some simple horn lines. The song was knocked out in two days. <laughs> you know, just the instant inspiration. Um, he and Cedric got together to write the song, um, hold on, Indian Summer Love. You know, um, Cedric had a ba basic idea for, for chord progression. Um, Skip added the, the bridge, you know, the song is in the key of D, the, the, uh, and he added the, the, the other chord progressions. Uh, and again, we, we, we just cut the track and then they had me add all the synthesizer parts and stuff on top. And um, I, I, he was just, just inspirational, man. He was just, 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 just wonderful. Um, 
bringing all that he had learned and and all of the stuff that he had been all the attitudes and I'm sorry I can't think I can't I'm, I'm old I can't think of the word <laughs> I'm gonna call it procedures from working with people the other people that we admired we were fire so he brought that to us yeah um, some of the magic best word there you go yeah <laughs> that was one of them yeah so how would you decide you know when Michael should take the lead vocal or you should do the lead vocal. Sometimes it was a case of Michael would just hear it in his head that it should be that trade-off thing. Um, songs like on uh, A Tear in My Eye, uh, I wrote it to be a two-voice thing, you know, because we were, again, I'm going to go back to all the groups we used to do, the, the, the OJs, two, two, two powerful lead singers, you know, Walter and, and, and Eddie, uh, the Earth, Wind & Fire thing. Um, uh, the stylistics going back, you know, uh, like, um, for instance, you make me feel brand new. Uh, I think it was Ariane was singing the first, was singing the first part, and then, um, oh my God, I cannot, I cannot remember his name, uh, the lead singer. And so sometimes, it, sometimes the song was just written that way, you know. Uh, uh, in other cases, um, oh, for instance, on fun. The whole idea was for it to be a group unison vocal, kind of based on the Brick. We, when Brick came out with, with, with Daz, we we're like, oh man, we, did, we like that. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, Michael based fun on Brick's that the the whole concept of okay that we have a, a unison group vocals and a flute solo, all that came from Brick's Daz. Thing. So he just borrowed those two elements, add some function, some function funk to it, and you know, made it our own. Well, yeah, bringing a flute to funk was a very cool move. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you first heard like fun played back and, and the, you and the rest of the band, did you guys just know, man, this is a hit? Or, yes. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, that that whole process of working again in, in the studio was skipped and hearing it back over the speakers. And it honestly really did feel different from when we recorded the first one. I mean, because we're despite the fact that we called in Ron to to, to produce, you know, he probably he, he pretty much let us do do our thing as far as making the decisions on, on how the song should go. And he you know, we just said, yeah, let us know if we're flat or sharp. But other than that, it was just about, yeah, y'all just go do what you do. I'll just you know make 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 sure it sounds good. Skip added some other sparkling stuff, but it was a whole different feeling recording this in in the studio in San Francisco, where, where we recorded. It. We recorded the first album, Confunction, at Arden Studios. Uh, this was um, at the Auto. We recorded Secrets at the Automat in San Francisco, and. Uh, yeah, man, it was. I, I I think you hit upon it. The word the word magic. The, the, just just the, the whole combination of between Skip's producing and what we were bringing to the table musically, and the engineer Don Cody, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it just all came together. Yeah, I, I need no say. <laughs> you know, Felton, I always believe there's a delicate balance that you strike. And Earth, Wind, and Fire, who you mentioned, of course, did it, and a lot of bands did it back then. But you know, being able to be catchy and sort of um, you know an earworm and 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 that way, but still uh, retain the funk, you know, and still retain that soul, and and not just make it sugar coated and, and and lose that, you know. And so you guys did such a great job of that, and the two vocal thing just helped make you guys you know sound uh, so unique and give it that special. Can function flavor. Yeah, I do. Um, so, how did it feel being on the same label as guys like the Ohio Players and the Barkays back then? Did you get to rub elbows with some of those cats? In intimidating. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, yeah, because like you know, our first time meeting the Ohio players, and thinking back, well, damn, two years ago we were just playing. You know, we were playing your songs. You know, it's like you know, I felt like you know we need to be bow bowing down to the royalty here. Yeah, it, it, it very intimidating. You know, um, oh, hold on, saying let me. I've, I've my, knocked out the plug. I'm so sorry. Um, and an honor, you know, because now it feels like we we, we graduated. You know. Um, to be able to share a stage with someone that a couple of years before we were, we were paying money to go see, or you know, um, it felt yeah, it felt like a we got 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 gotten a promotion. It was still it was still intimidating. Don't don't, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Um, but it felt like yeah, we had arrived. We can go backstage and, and, and talk to these guys, and uh, and even on our, on our on our first major tour, which was us, um, LTD, and Rolls Royce, right? Um, what was really nice about that tour was that the fact that the other artists, the guys that we were sitting back in and admiring, took us under their way and, and, and gave us you know, tips and stuff. I, you know, I know me personally, every single night, once I got dressed from, from, from opening up for, for the show, every single night, I was out watching LTD, you know, watching Rolls Royce and watching how they did it. You know, uh, and and the same thing for when we toured with the, with, with with the OJ's and with and, and with Bootsy. At that point, it was still a learning experience for me. You know, it was I'm glad to be there and and honored that my name was on the billboard, helping to bring in some of the tickets. But I'm still feeling like a student. <laughs> you know, um, you know, just just speaking for me personally, it was like. Um, it wasn't until that we were headlining our own tour. I think it was us, the Gap Band, McFadden and Whitehead, and Anita Ward, mm -hmm. right? Where it felt like, and wait a minute, and then we have groups coming to us talking about how they admire us. Mm -hmm. Man, this is kind of weird, <laughs> weird, uh, hum almost humbling. You know, um, but it, it was just a, a, a mind blowing. You know, uh, were, were you more the kind of guy that um, really loved being in the studio, or more on stage, or what was what was, you know, what was your passion? Um, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, and you know that sensation that you get that 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 good feeling that you get when your employer tells you that you've done a good job. Mm -hmm. Well. When I'm standing on stage, I'm getting that from all 5,000 of my employers at the same time. That's, that's been my drug, man. That, that, that standing on stage and performing in front of, of a live audience, it, that's nothing, nothing tops that for me. It's a different kind of sensation in the studio because it, because it takes longer. The immediate sensation of getting that on stage, I play a five minute song and there's that applause, right? I, I, that's wonderful. It takes a lot longer for that gratification to happen in the studio. But once I've spent, you know, several hours working on something and then, okay, I can hear it back. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a longer gratification and a different kind, but you know, it's, it's it kind of ties in to it, but that's, that's, that's the two elements of, of, of that fun. Felton, talk to me a little bit about some of the personalities that were in the band. You know, what what were the guys like, you know, off the stage, in the studio? <laughs> Let me start with Maceo. Maceo was our original sax player. And Maceo and I have been friends since since fifth grade. You know, so you know, we are we had 
I didn't just know him as a musician. I just, I knew him as someone I would play tag with out on, on, on the schoolyard. I remember, um, uh, funny how you remember some stuff. Uh, I had an orange in my, in, in my, in my lunchbox and I peeled it and I cut it in half and I gave him half and he said, thank you. And just as he took it, a seagull took a crap on my half <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and ran away. <laughs> you know. But, but, and so his, he was like the main jokester in, in the group, you know, um, uh, and pretty much his personality on stage matched what he was in person, you know, just constantly outgoing. Uh, I don't ever remember hearing a harsh or, you know, mad word from him. Um, Cedric was the youngest person in the band. Um, the adventuresome, he would do, uh, is it, is it, is it, Windsurfing, parasailing, is that, is, that, is, that, is that the same thing? Okay. He, and he wanted to go learn how to fly airplanes. So you know, he was, he's, he's Mr. Mr. Ed, Ed, Adventuresome and I'm like. Uh, he held down that bottom though. Huh? He held down that bottom. Oh, oh absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I remember him asking me to, to come learn how to go hang gliding. I said, no, dude, you got two laws. You have the law of gravity and Murphy's law working against you. No, <laughs> not gonna happen with me. Um, Carl was uh, Carl Fuller, uh, the other member of the band who's still with 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 the current version of Confunction, uh, was the oldest in the band. So he was uh, pretty much kept to himself. Was you know um, very focused focused on perfecting his trumpet. And, and stuff like that. Um, Danny Thomas uh, was the uh, keyboard player in the group. Um, our nickname for him was Sweet Man. The Sweet Man that he was, you know, had, if I had to, to, to mention someone with the most swagger, it was probably Danny. Yeah, he was he was just too cool, you know, then work hat kicked over the side. Danny, Dad, Danny was just looking real cool. Uh who did I leave out here? Uh uh M Michael was my counterpart. Michael Michael was all about the music, all about about the business of keeping the band going and what what is it can what is it that can can we do to go from here to here? And um writing songs and how do we stay relevant how do we stay competitive and how do we you know um lewis the drummer lewis was um i i, I couldn't say that he was all about about about, about the music you know um Lewis was about having a good time, you know. Um, but very efficient when it came to drumming. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, he, you know, once, once, once we walked on stage, it was Laser locked in. That, that's where he is. Now, off the stage, <laughs> anyone seen Lewis? No. <laughs> Gone, right? You know, um, I think I think I think pretty much covered covered everybody. But yeah, he was uh, Lewis was solid, and he wasn't what what wasn't flashy, but just totally solid. You know, <laughs> you know, and that and that again worked out well for us. You know, because you know we we weren't doing flashy. wasn't that wasn't our thing. You know, the guys. Uh, Again, being the top 40 band was all about copying the other people's records. And so our thing, musically speaking, was from a studio perspective. You know, even our large performances, our goal was to sound as close to whoever's record, whether it was someone else's or ours. So that required a lot of precision. Precision. Um, concentration, you know, and 
And um, I'm so sorry, man. Can I think of that think of that other word? But yeah, yeah. Um, focus. Yeah. Focus. Yeah.